Recent events in the Middle East have brought the truth of Psalm 122 to the forefront. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O oh, Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O oh, Jerusalem. You see, all of Bible prophecy revolves around Israel and Jerusalem. And Bible prophecy is moving so fast that we have to live every day as if the Lord could return for us at any moment. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Hello, I'm Christine Dark. The perilous times the Bible warned us about are bearing down upon us. The Hamas war against Israel caught both Israel and the world by surprise with a whole new level of evil, with terrorists flying in on hang gliders to rape and plunder. As a result of war in Israel, many people are genuinely wondering if Bible prophecy is being fulfilled and if this is the beginning of the end. Many are wondering and speculating, will the Antichrist soon step forward to sign some sort of peace agreement that could trigger the period known in the Bible as the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble? In Matthew 24, Jesus said wars and rumors of wars are among the multiple signs of the soon return of the Lord. But I dare say the average man on the street really does not understand the complexities of the historic Middle East conflict. And if you claim to be a believer in Jesus the Messiah, and if you claim to study the Bible, I hope you know that the Bible commands you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the Bible also informs you in no uncertain terms that you have a debt and spiritual responsibilities to Israel. Why? because we received from the Jewish people the Bible and the Savior. The Jewish people have been the vehicle of world redemption. What sort of ingrates would we be if we stood by and allowed the Jewish people to be persecuted and annihilated once again? But now we are witnessing a whole new, highly dangerous level of anti-Semitism, reminiscent of World War II and the Nazis. I never thought I'd live to see such hatred. Yet inside the cradle of democracy, members of London's parliament debated about a foreign war in Gaza, while outside protesters in Parliament Square projected the genocidal call of incitement from the river to the sea onto the tower of the most famous clock in the world, Big Ben, defiling it with anti-Semitism. I wonder if the average man on the street understands the meaning of the chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, and how it's fueling anti-Semitism. And here's a scary question. Is the handwriting on the clock tower a sign that Britain's time is up? You see, the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is the infamous war cry by those waging so-called holy war, jihad. And the chant represents gross anti-Israel and anti-Jewish incitement. Yet the slogan was boldly projected onto the structure that symbolizes democracy. And the clock tower is an icon for the British nation. The fact that a genocidal war cry was allowed to be projected onto the famous clock tower sent a very sobering message to the church about what time it is. Israel is the proverbial canary in the coal mine of the nations. The expression canary in the coal mine means something that acts as an early warning of a danger or problem. The theory was that canaries were more sensitive to noxious gases than humans, and so a canary would die in a coal mine if conditions were unsafe for men working 
and would provide a warning to the men to leave the mine before they were stricken with the same fate as the poor canary. Well, the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign organized the belligerent protest outside the commons and told demonstrators to ramp up the pressure on members of parliament and instructed them to demonstrate in such numbers that parliament would have to lock their doors. The mob also blocked traffic and set off flares. And the Metropolitan Police let it all happen, even though police have legal powers to prevent disruption to the life of the community, just as they have powers to prevent demonstrators from screaming deaf to the Jews. Members of Parliament are being physically intimidated. Mike Freer, a conservative member of Parliament who represents a constituency with a significant Jewish population, announced that he will no longer seek re-election due to threats to him and his family over support for Israel. Freer also revealed that he has started to wear stab-proof vests under his garments. This is because in 2021, another conservative member of parliament, Sir David Amos, was stabbed to death by a jihadist. And in 2017, outside the gates of parliament, a jihadist mowed down pedestrians before stabbing an unarmed police officer to death. However, ever since October 7, 2023, when Hamas terrorists killed 1,200 people in southern Israel and took hostages captive, parliament members have faced angry mobs when out in public, and anti-Semitism has grown at a frightening pace. It's as if an anti-Israel derangement syndrome has overtaken the minds of many persons who heretofore expressed no particular interest in the Middle East or politics. Students on campuses are demonstrating against Jews like scenes out of Nazi Germany. And in the USA, the pro-Palestinian cause has pushed at least two individuals as of this taping to set themselves on fire one last December in front of the Israeli consulate in Atlanta, Georgia, and more recently, a 25-year-old American airman died when he tragically set himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. The airman began streaming a live video before dousing himself with fuel and lighting himself up for the Palestinian cause. He was taken to hospital with critical injuries where he was pronounced dead. Speaking in the House of Commons, Jewish Member of Parliament Andrew Percy said he had just returned from Israel and had actually felt safer in Israel than in the UK. Journalist Dan Hodges wrote on X that elected representatives are being intimidated by jihadists living in their midst. So what does the proverbial handwriting on the Tower of Big Ben mean? Why is this chant being shouted in protest against Israel? It concerns what the Bible calls the controversy of Zion. First of all, we have to understand that Israel has always been hated and persecuted because Satan rejects the prophetic agenda of God and deeply resents that Israel was the conduit of the Messiah Jesus to enter the world as our one and only savior. Furthermore, the Jewish people were chosen by God to be the scribes, the guardians, the custodians of this word of God. Satan just hates that and lashes out against the Jews for being God's chosen people. As Tevye, the milkman, quipped to God in Fiddler on the Roof, I know we are your chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? The truth is, God chose the Jews to be his missionary nation to the world. And so the powers of darkness are in perpetual enmity against the Jews. The territory between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea refers to the nation of Israel. That's the territory the Palestinians want to liberate for themselves by exterminating the Jews. The chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, means that Israel must cease to exist. But Israel is God's timepiece, his clock, telling the world what time it is on the Bible's prophetic agenda. 
It's been said the minute hand of God's clock represents what's happening in Jerusalem. And the second hand points to activities on the most contested real estate in the world, the Temple Mount. An important sacrifice will reportedly take place this spring in Jerusalem at the Passover holiday. Thus, the powers of darkness are stirred, agitated, and anxious because Satan knows the return of Jesus to rule this world is imminent. Every conflict over Israel is an end time sign and a wake up call that the end of the church age is near prior to the time the Bible calls the great tribulation or Jacob's trouble. For the past 2000 years, the grace of God has been made available to Gentiles. But now the accelerated increase in anti-Semitism that was prophesied in the Bible is signaling that we are approaching the end of the age. Wars will continue in the Middle East, including a war prophesied in the book of Ezekiel, and also the Battle of Armageddon in Israel in the Valley of Megiddo. There can be no doubt that the accelerated hatred for the Jewish people is a major prophetic sign of the times. Colonist Melanie Phillips reported that in a town in the north of Wales, recently a Jewish member of the community went to visit a shop but there was a sign in the shop window saying Zionists were unwelcome. This is quite alarming because education is not just remembering that first German shops prohibited the entry of Jews and then Hitler rounded up and killed six million Jews, but education is understanding how millions of ordinary Germans were convinced that anti-Semitism was okay and the norm. Real education is learning how to spot the signs of history repeating itself. Now the war cry of Palestine will be free from the river to the sea calls for the genocide of Jews and Palestinian occupation of all the promised land that is presently on the maps as the land of Israel. It's a call to arms in the Hamas charter but the fact that many university students are chanting this genocidal call for Jews is quite alarming. The specific geography behind the chant, as I said, refers to the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. But anybody who is chanting this war cry is shaking their fist in the face of God Almighty because he's the one who has established Israel's borders as an everlasting covenant in the Bible. And it's called the promised land. Presently, of course, Israel does not hold all of the promised land, only a small portion of it, about the size of the American state of New Jersey. But according to the Bible, the promised land actually stretches from the Nile River to the Euphrates River, including territory occupied by Palestinians in the West Bank of Judea and Samaria, as well as the Gaza Strip. Although Israel currently possesses only a small portion of the landmass God promised as an irrevocable covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Bible scholars believe that during the millennial rule of King Messiah, Israel will possess all the land God promised to them. At that time, the Arabs will live in peace and harmony with Israel along the Isaiah 19 highway of Egypt, Israel, and Assyria joined together in a messianic league. That's why we pray for all the peoples of the region to be delivered from the tyranny of jihad, including the Arabs, who were tortured by an antichrist spirit of death and hate. We're sure that many who are marching in the UK and in the USA and on university campuses don't even realize that Hamas war cry amounts to the genocide of the Jewish people. And many demonstrators simply are ignorant of the history of anti-Semitism. Many of these protesters espouse liberal and far left ideologies and views, for example, on gender fluidity and they're chanting from the river to the sea. But they also don't seem to have a clue that if they attempted to introduce their leftist and sexual ideologies into areas like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Islamic Republic of Iran, they themselves would be beheaded or killed because of their leftist views. Do these people who are marching against Israel really want the total eradication of the Jews? But whether or not the man on the street understands what they are parroting, genocide is the bottom line of the Hamas war cry. 
And can a Christian be a part of this hatred? It is certainly not possible for genuine believers in the Messiah who call themselves Christians to participate in anti-Semitic genocidal calls against the Jewish state. The Jews are our patriarchs in the faith. Furthermore, and this is a warning I give to everybody in love, every Jew hater is tragically calling down upon himself a curse according to Genesis 12, 3, where God says that he will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who treat Israel with contempt. So according to the Bible's perspective, to participate in a genocidal call against Israel is to call down on oneself the curse and judgment of God. And who in their right mind would do that to themselves? And any nation that comes against Israel will also bear the consequences, as history has shown. Apparently, the former British Home Secretary, Sue Ella Braverman, does understand what's at stake. In an article that she wrote for The Telegraph, she said that the left-wing extremists took control of the streets and that anti-Semites got the upper hand. She wrote, quote, They have bullied the Labor Party. They have bullied our institutions. And now they have bullied our country into submission, end quote. Braverman added that British leaders are terrified of being called racist. The harsh reality is that an outrage culture has become pervasive in our digital age. Outrage culture refers to our collective tendency to react, often with intense negativity, to developments around us. Modern outrage culture is linked to cancel culture, which demonizes people and groups like Jews as well as Bible-believing Christians. Social media is often the starting point and propagator for outrage culture. The technological innovations of the internet, smartphones, and social media are enabling communal outrage, sometimes on a global scale. Multiple societies can be affected at once, as witnessed with the Me Too movement. Navigating the pitfalls of outrage culture requires us to adopt a more reflective approach before daring to participate in public condemnation. It's been noted that outrage culture runs counter to moral ideals that most people admire. Beliefs such as the fact that it's okay to have different opinions. Everyone makes mistakes and people are worth more than their worst actions. We also have to admit that people are also capable of growth and change and deserve a second chance sometimes. But the pro-Hamas protesters seem to be adamant in their commitment to wipe every Jew off the face of the earth. And this is not just a regional Middle East problem. If you pay attention to the United Nations resolutions, they make more resolutions against Israel than all the other countries combined. And this jihad is becoming more aggressive. To compound the problem, Israel's enemies are increasingly acquiring deadly weaponry. Iran is arming both the terrorist organizations Hamas and Hezbollah. But Christians are also pushing back. Christians are standing up for biblical truth in this hour. Recently at the National Religious Broadcasters Annual Convention in Nashville, Tennessee, a biblical heartland resolution was announced calling for media and individuals worldwide to stop referring to Israel's biblical heartland as the West Bank and instead to use its Bible name, Judea and Samaria. What exactly is the definition of the West Bank? It's biblical territory that stretches along the west banks of the Jordan River and most of the Dead Sea which is why this biblical heartland territory unfortunately received the secular name West Bank. The holy city of Jerusalem is considered to be part of the so-called West Bank, with East Jerusalem being claimed as the capital by both Israelis and Arabs. But in order to try to clear up the confusion, the Christian media adopted the biblical name Judea and Samaria over the term West Bank. Israeli author Pesach Waleki Israel Allies Foundation President Joshua Reinstein 
and National Religious Broadcasters NRB President Troy Miller held a press conference to explain the new resolution. The president and CEO of the NRB, Troy Miller, said he endorsed the resolution opposing using the term West Bank and instead wanted to adopt the term Judea and Samaria because he said the NRB opposes the use of the erroneous term West Bank to describe the Bible heartland of Israel. And he called on its members to refer to the region by its historic name, Judea and Samaria. Miller said that Christians reading their Bibles look at the biblical map and see that Judea and Samaria are part of that land. Miller said, I think your words matter and the truth matters as well. So it's time for us to step up and be honest about the truth of what's happened in Israel in the definition of the Bible land. Miller said he believes Christians across America will also endorse the resolution, which was prepared as a collaboration between Israel 365 News, the Israel Allies Foundation, and members of the Broadcasting Network. NRB has over 1,100 member organizations that reach millions of viewers, listeners, and readers. The page-long resolution contains an explanatory preamble highlighting that Judea and Samaria are the biblical heartland of Israel, including sites such as Hebron, Bethel, Shiloh, and Shechem, along with many other places with rich biblical heritage. Furthermore, Scripture foretells both the exile and return of the Jewish people back to Judea and Samaria in our lifetime. The resolution also noted, and this is vital, that Judea and Samaria are critical to Israeli security. As the Samaritan mountains overlook the Israeli coast, including Tel Aviv and other major population centers and Israel's international airport. Also, the resolution noted that the presence of the Jewish people in Judea and Samaria in modern times is a blessing to Palestinians living there because Israeli investment and jobs provide economic opportunity for their Palestinian neighbors. Josh Reinstein, Israel Allies Foundation president, said that people need to understand that language matters. He explained that the term West Bank is merely a geographical term applicable to the country of Jordan, which occupied the area from 1949 to 1967. Jordan renamed the West Bank for its location west of the Jordan River. However, by contrast, Reinstein said Judea and Samaria have been in the heartland of the people of Israel for thousands of years. Now, in summary, the situation of the menace of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is forcing nations and churches to decide where they're going to stand. There's a separation process beginning even now that Jesus, Yeshua, will conclude when he returns to separate the obedient sheep nations from the rebellious goat nations. God is using the pain and trauma happening in Israel to force nations into the valley of decision. In conclusion today, we want to emphasize that this is the time for informed people to get ready for the return of Messiah. It's such a serious hour and a time not to be drifting spiritually. You need to know how to make peace with God because all the signs point to the sudden return of Jesus for the rapture of the church. And you have to be ready before it's too late. Yes, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but most of all, it's urgent to pray for yourself and your family, not to be deceived in this last hour through careless living, through bad relationships and sin. So many Bible prophecies have already come to pass with complete and total accuracy. And as I've said many times, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us, but to prepare us. So in order to have peace with God, we have to recognize our sin. And there must be a time when we go in all humility before God and say, Lord God, I know you are a holy God and that I have sinned against you and made mistakes. I'm willing to acknowledge that I've broken your commandments and I recognize my sin and I'm willing to repent and turn my back on sin to be saved from this corrupt generation. Then we must be willing to receive God's Redeemer 
the Lord Jesus Christ into our hearts. There's no way to have a right relationship with God except through faith in Jesus the Messiah. The essential doctrine of the Bible is faith in Christ alone to obtain forgiveness of sins. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's not one person on earth who can say, I've never sinned. But forgiveness is universally available through God and His Son, Jesus, the Messiah. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, promises, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we invite you in childlike faith to pray a sinner's prayer. Just say, Heavenly Father, today I confess my sin and I trust in your only begotten Son who died for me. I believe he was buried and rose again and he promised he will return. So I hasten to turn away from sin and I ask you to cleanse me, mind, body, and soul, to receive salvation as the gift of God, not by my own works, but by your great mercy. And according to Romans 10, 13, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Believers are no longer under the curse of sin, but we're a new creation in Messiah. Hallelujah. I hope you prayed with me and I'd love to hear from you on many of the social media platforms. Please explore our website also, exploits.tv and our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site, there's a library of videos 24-7. Well, Daniel 11.32 declares the people who know their God will be strong, not weak, and will accomplish exploits, meaning will do the works of the Lord in the remaining time before His imminent return. And don't forget to check out our free Jerusalem Channel mobile app, as well as my extensive archive of in-depth articles at my Substack page. Until next time, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dart. Shalom and Maranatha.